Okay, yeah, so thanks very much. Um, hopefully that the, the uh, things I'll speak about will uh, sometimes reinforce and also build upon some of the issues that, that Alma's already raised. So um, this is a, a paper um, that's been written by uh, myself and Sandra Walkway. Um, we have actually a finished paper, but it's uh, finished, not finished that is. Uh, we don't speak Finnish unfortunately. Uh, a finished paper that's under review for a special edition that Adam Crawford is, uh, is hoping to publish in the British Journal of Criminology. So we're quite happy to make it uh, available once it's been uh, reviewed and come back. So if anybody does want to uh, read more, then of course we'll be willing to send it on. So what we're trying to do then, I think, is try and bring together um, the research that we've done on counter-terrorism regulation in terms of discourses, in terms of policies and in terms of practices over the last 10 years and to reflect on what it can tell us about the limits to debates and discussions about security. So in this presentation I want to try and split it down into three connected observations. Uh, those around divisions which are reproduced by policy, those around particular dualisms or ambivalences and also those around duplicity, so the ways in which things are mischievously, erroneously and ideologically presented by the state in order to secure social control or particular political, geographical and economic ends. So we started to, to think there were some loose ends uh, from this book that we uh, published early on in the year called Contradictions of Terrorism. So what we're trying to do here is to think about the way in which there are uh, paradoxes which emerge in terms of the construction and representation of the terrorist threat. We're interested to try and ask the questions about what kinds of things are perpetually prioritised in national security and what kinds of discussions are eluded or omitted. And that led us to think, I, I think, about some of the, um, obviously the gaps in terms of the way in which criminology approaches security. So there's very little good experiential data on what security means, on what it means to be subjected to the security of the state. Indeed, what insecurity feels like at an ontological level. So there are lots of gaps, there are lots of things that haven't been uncovered or, or dug deep enough in terms of the experiential angles. And there's also not a great deal in criminology, in my view, of conceptual machinery through which we can understand and stretch the notion of security. So I think our work has, has tended to, to look towards geography international relations, political sciences, uh, and, and find some critical work in those domains. And I think in mainstream uh, criminology, there's not an awful lot of useful conceptual work. A lot of it tends to draw upon kind of uh, accepted notions of risk and security. So we're trying to say, well, what does it look like if we try and reconceive understandings of, of terrorism and also understandings of security, which let in alternate voices? So just a bit of context, I want really to get on to the, the main body of the paper. Obviously, um, common notions of security, many of these are, are picked up within mainstream criminology, are assuming a kind of zero-sum game. So we often hear talk about the kind of balance between liberty and security, as though a reduction in one you know, needs to a kind of advance in the other, and vice versa. Now that's been, I think, commonly used also in criminology. We would contest that view. We think that's an erroneous assumption, as indeed other thinkers such as Barbara Hudson have argued strongly. There's also an assumption that security seeking is a public good, particularly security seeking on behalf of the state. And the examples that we're going to use uh, in this paper demonstrate that in many cases uh, the seeking of security can lead to insecurities. So there's a way in which security has been dominantly constructed, which, to borrow, borrow Bob Jessup's term, has led to complexity reduction. And indeed, the examples which Alma used there in relation to radicalisation are good examples of how very complex, uh, nuanced, networked, uh, contested processes are reduced down to kind of bite sizes through which we can understand them and through which we can treat them. So some of the examples you used, I think, already are very, uh, are very poignant. But if you look at prevent and how it understands vulnerability. The definition in the glossary, prevent for vulnerability, reads something to the effect of uh, somebody who is vulnerable to the process of radicalization. So there's a kind of tautology there, and I'll talk a little bit more about some other examples of, of the way in which language is used to reduce the complexity of situations and to eliminate the context. So to assume that things are at kind of day one. So amongst all this, obviously one of the well-documented shifts has been around a, a different calculus of risk. Uh, this is embedded in obviously many political speeches dating back to, to George Bush and, and Tony Blair, the use of 
uh, increasing need for the use of preemptive technologies of risk regulation in the domain of counter-terrorism but also in other forms of crime and security control and also the activist military policy so state violence which has led to the reproduction of various forms of, of insecurity. So as I said earlier I think we've found that all this has led to some kind of very big gaps around how we understand people's experiences of security and insecurity and also some kind of conceptual gaps so a need to uh, develop an architecture through which we can stretch notions of security and begin to understand it in a more sophisticated fashion. So in terms of the divisions, obviously the work of Stuart Hall, the classic work of Stuart Hall, and indeed followed on by uh, Paddy Hilliard, has demonstrated delineation of suspect populations. And not only the delineation of suspect populations, but the materialization of notions of suspect populations into policy and practice. So what Richard Erickson has eloquently called counter laws. So laws such as um, Section 44 stop and search, laws such as control orders, laws such as TPIMs, which actually are anti-democratic. They undermine the very basis of human rights and liberties on which law is built. So in relation to the divisions which are reproduced, we can also talk about particular uh, outcomes in terms of the people who are the subjects within suspect populations. So research that we've conducted over seven or eight years now with Fatima Khan, in which we've spoken to many uh, young British Muslims, mainly in the northwest of England, uh, about their experiences of regulation, the way in which they're surveyed, what these kind of interventions mean for them on a day-to-day -day level, has very clearly shown the divisive effects of these security policies. And they're not just at the level of, well, it's kind of a bit, bit, you know, a bit sort of upsetting to keep being stopped and searched. They go much deeper than that, and they affect people's values. They affect their behaviours. They affect the language they use. They affect the way in which they present themselves in the public sphere. They affect the kinds of things that people think they're able to talk about. So they're very deep-rooted divisions. They may on the surface seem to be things that we can look at statistically and say, well, yes, we know that if you're a, a young British Muslim and you're male, you're 13 times more likely to be stopped than if you're a, you know, a, a white British female. But they drill down and have some very, very serious ramifications and effects. And I think the two uh, quotes there by Salahuddin and Kassim make that point quite clearly. You know, they're, they're, they're sources of frustration, but they also have very, very strong material effects. So in relation to PREVENT, um, Alma mentioned some of the um, problems with PREVENT. I think the government have ramped up, rather than reduced down, the cap capillaries and capacities through which they're utilising PREVENT. So despite the fact that it's been roundly criticised, it's been shot through the head by Harold Kandani. So if you read Spooked, if you read his more recent uh, 2015 report for Claystone, which I think is called a decade lost, that you, there's nothing left to say about how negative the implications of PREVENT have been in the various initiatives within PREVENT. However, what the government are doing is actually moving further down the line. They're pursuing that ideational component, which I think was tempered with the Liberal Democrats. I think they kind of managed to find a way in which they could reduce some of the more pernicious effects of those policies, which sought to manipulate people's ideas. But if you look at the actual language which is now being used, this is in Prevent Duty Guidance. This is what all of us working at UK universities have to implement. Okay, so we not only have to go along with it, we are duty bound to identify extremism. Now what's important here is we're not duty bound to, to identify violent extremism, which was the previous terminology. We're now invited to identify and report extremism. Now that's bad enough. But look how extremism is being defined. So opposition to fundamental British values, whatever they might be and however they're conceived, including democracy. So who here in this room has not written or thought critically about the formal democratic process? <laughs> including the rule of law. Well, entire criminology and law departments have been shut down here. Now this is only tongue in cheek because it's, it's quite ridiculous. However, it's now statute. So somehow, the, the kind of creeping tentacles of policy and practice and, and ideational notions of security are being withered away. And it's indexed, obviously, to, to an attempt to reduce resistance and to enhance social control through terrorism. So as we've said before many years ago, uh, rather than governing through crime, which was 
uh, obviously a very famously uh, used phrase, we've argued that there's an attempt to govern through terrorism. So these might be counter-terrorism policies, but they're, they're designed to have all sorts of effects to, to reduce the freedoms and rights of individuals. So the dualisms then, um, one of the things that's quite interesting, I think, is that the state has always uh, retained the mythology of, of providing universal rights and liberties. Uh, now, it's never done so. Western nation states, Western capitalist states have never done so, as we all know. However, I think the state has become quite emboldened such that it no longer even promises that those rights and liberties will be defended. So this is taken from the UK security strategy. So to protect the security and freedom of the many, the state sometimes has to encroach on the liberties of a few, those who threaten us. Now disregarding the, 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 the kind of problems associated with trying to define who it is that threatens us, and we all know about various miscarriages of, of, of justice that uh, come to pass through uh, faulty intelligence and, and, and policing, the state is no longer, even at that level of ideas, saying that it will secure the security of all its citizens. So security has become, even at a formal level, partial. So we've talked about partial forms of security. So certain groups are protected by freedoms, rights and liberties, and others, well, it's contingent. They have to commit to particular ideas. They have to assimilate in particular ways. So this reproduces for us what we've called a risk-security paradox. Now this works in, in, in multiple ways. I mean, one way it works, if you go back to the, the, the quotes taken here from um, the empirical data, is that those people who are actually incredibly law-abiding, those populations who don't figure very highly in crime statistics, so the most safest populations in many regards, find themselves being treated as the most risky. However, for them, their own security is threatened by being treated as risky. So you've got a paradoxical situation. Again, if we think back to prevent, and again talking about the extension of the powers, well, it used to be the case in the initial iteration of prevent that it was seeking out people who were risky. That's the point of the kind of original iteration of the channel. You know, we look at people who might be risky, they might be de uh, dangerous, they might be threatening, they might be saying things which, which you know, we might interpret as dangerous. But if you now look at it, it's not just people who are risky, it's people who are at risk of being risky. <laughs> so again, you have a role, and this is why you've got school children. You know, you've, you've got hundreds of school children being put under, kind of under the radar, you know, having to discuss what they've put on their jotters and, and being you know, subject to intervention from channel project. So again, there's, a, there's an extension again, a, a, a forcing through, a coercive forcing through of what's sayable and, and, and what's risky and what might be risky in particular contexts. So I think we can safely say uh, it's a question that I think many Nordic scholars have been grappling with uh, for quite some time. You know the, the effects of counterterrorism policy, these kind of interventions, both the hard-edged ones that around glorification of terrorism and stop and search, but also the the policies which seek to, to ally to community cohesion and integration have done. Um, they've argued that they've produced some iatrogenic effects. So people like Dalgard Nielsen, people like uh, Lasse Lindekilter, have argued that these they've produced these kind of side effects. I think what Sandra and I have argued is that it's actually, it actually goes much deeper and runs much further than that. Because the effects are not necessarily iatrogenic, they actually reproduce the law of inverse consequences. So that's to say the very defined outcome of enhancing security reproduces the exact opposite. It reproduces endemic insecurity for some populations. So the intervention itself obviously has these um, effects which are beyond, for us, iatrogenic. They're not just side effects, they bring about the opposite than the stated formal aim. Now in relation to, to impacts and effects on particular populations so surveyed, well these are quite diffuse. So we found in our studies, and we've done now four empirical studies, mainly using focus groups um, and uh, follow-up in, uh, interviews, we found that there have been lots of examples of resistance. We've had a, you know, a, a number of, of people in each of these studies we've done who said, well, look, I, I don't give a shit. I'm not going to change my behavior. I'm not going to change my dress. I'm not going to change my expression. This is me. This is my expression, my identity, and I'm not going to be restricted. But they're actually in the minority. What we found amongst the biggest groups and the focus groups we've done is a kind of ambiguous process where people recognize the nonsense that's being related here. You know, there's stuff around 
uh, the way in which their ideas are manipulated, the things that they can't say, you know, their, their, the values, the way in which their religious values are being contorted in terms of representation. They recognize that, but they also realize that if they, if they kind of say the things that might be sayable for white British people around opposition to forms of, of counter-terrorism regulation, around opposition to forms of military policy and intervention, then they're likely to be treated suspiciously by the police, by members of the public, in educational settings and so on. So what you get is what we've called forms of securitized reflexivity. So this is one example here, Zane, he's talking about um, walking home at night times in, in Manchester. So if I'm going anywhere I don't know, especially if it's late on the night, I sometimes cover my beard up a bit or maybe take my hat off. Generally I wouldn't during the daytime, but if I'm walking in an area I don't know, I may cover up a bit just out of fear of attack. So we had all sorts of similar examples along the continuum. So, uh, one woman uh, in one of the studies said, I don't wear black because terrorists wear black. I know it's ridiculous, but people treat me differently if I wear all black clothing. We had guys who said, I always keep my beard trimmed to European regulation length. <laughs> so basically, you know, if, you, if I go to work and I've got a, the beard that I would like to grow, I'm treated very differently. We had people who said, you know, I just don't talk, talk in uh, Urdu or Punjabi when I'm you know, in public transport or in, in particular social circles because people respond in different ways. So I would argue, or we've argued, that it's a form of reflexivity around security which is far more advanced than, than many would, ha would have to do or deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So even though the kind of no ideological notions or ideational notions are rejected, still the practice are being modified and altered. Okay, so the final uh, level at which this operates, and I'll probably just have time to, to go through these before, um, before finishing it, is around what we've called um, duplicities. So uh, this is around the way in which security discourses are both uh, simultaneously amplified and muted. So if we look at, um, if we look at the, the statistics, for example, on terrorist attacks in the UK, you know, we know you're far more likely to be knocked off your bike or you, you know, uh, have an uh, adverse reaction and die from a bee sting. Yet the treatment of terrorism presumes priority at a political level. The resources driven to national security strategies are immense. So the question then becomes, well, you know, what, what is it that's being amplified? And what is it that actually is being silenced or, or cannot be said around the actions of terrorists? So this is uh, Mohammed Sadiq Khan, and this is his uh, so-called jihadi video statement. Now, of course, uh, it's highly likely he didn't write this stuff, but if you look at the, the kind of vindication or, or, or uh, rationalization of, uh, he's making here for committing the atrocities that he did, um, then he's making direct reference to what's happening in the Middle East. He's making direct reference to state violence from Western nations. Now again, these kind of discussions are not up for grabs. And despite the fact that this kind of um, position has been stated by many, many people involved in uh, political violence associated with Islamic extremism, there's next to none of this in, re in relation to why people are radicalised. So if you look at the, the prevent strategy, there's very little, in fact, almost no discussion of the role of, of states, of military policy, of histories of colonialism and imperialism. So these things aren't on the table. Now I would argue if you want to, if you want to try and really tackle the process of radicalisation, if indeed it exists, then you have to grapple at least with the expressed reasons why people engaged in this kind of violence say that they committed the atrocities they did. So there's a kind of duplicity and amplification and muting all at the same time. Now, if we think about two, two examples, I've nicked these actually from a, a, a wreath lecture delivered by Walt Sayinka, a Nigerian poet, uh, way back in 2004. I think the point made here is, is quite important around the, the ways in which people's securities are, are treated quite differently. So the one on the left, we're probably many of us will recognise as the, the plane um, which was subject to a terrorist attack and uh, came down over Lockerbie. The one on the right, probably fewer people will recognise, and this is a, a, a terrorist attack on a, a plane that came down in uh, Niger in the Sahara, um, around about half a year later. I think about 260 people died in this instance, I think about 180 in this instance. Now the point that Sainka makes about this is that the treatment of these two uh, terrorist attacks is very different at all sorts of level. I mean, most of us probably wouldn't know about this one. It didn't receive an awful lot of media attention, particularly in the West. Now, if you look at the forms of compensation that were paid out to victims' families, 
Well, in this case, up to $10 million. In this case, between 3,000 and 30,000 euros. So there are real questions here, and that's the point that Soyinka is making about whose security counts, under which conditions, and whose security we talk about, both in terms of the kind of political uh, debates and media debates, but also us within the field of social science, within criminology, within sociology, and within political science. So I think the final point then, I'll, I'll end on this point, and I won't bother concluding because I think it's less of a paper that concludes rather than one that opens up discussion, hopefully. Um, Again, what's being glossed over is the kind of systemic state violence and the, the, the kind of hypocrisies which are used around security. And I think a really neat quote here by the philosopher uh, Alain Verdure makes that point. So he talks about zero deaths applying only to the Western military. The bombs they drop kill a lot of people who are to blame for living underneath. Well, these casualties are Afghans, Palestinians. They don't belong to modernity. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thanks, Matthew.